In the wise words of user Guitar Emoji, hiatus is just emo for breakup. And modern baseball has been on hiatus for almost four years. It's a tough fact to swallow, and I didn't want to accept it for a long time. I kept telling myself, you know, maybe it is just a hiatus. Maybe they'll come back. But as time passes, it makes less and less sense for them to get back together. Sean's a married dad now, Jake and Ian are doing Slaughter Beach full time, and Bren seems to want to lay as low as possible. The more you look at the circumstances, the easier it is to accept they'll never return. And in a way, it becomes beautiful. People grow, change, and leave things behind, yet we'll always have their music to look back on and remember what once was. All we can do is reminisce upon the good times and do our best to keep their memory alive. And today, I want to do just that, keep their spirit alive by having fun conversations about their work. Today we're going to discuss their best release ever, The Perfect Cast EP. We're going to discuss the music, the lyrics, where the band was at when releasing it, and we'll even discuss the album art. Without further ado, let's do it. It's a strange and unexpected occurrence when a band's best material can be found on an EP. But at the same time, modern baseball's existence was strange and unexpected. They came out of nowhere, grew bigger than anyone could have imagined, became a household name in emo, and broke up. They have the story every band wishes they could have. Go away to college, start a band with your friends, get so big you drop out, and become rock stars. And Mobo lived out every aspect of that scenario, except for the last. They lived the rock star life for a brief period before laying the band to rest. In years 2014, 15, and 16, they toured hard and traveled the world. For a while, it seemed like they said yes to every tour offer. And while their busy tour schedule helped them grow, it was the catalyst which caused them to burn out. It was fun at first, traveling somewhere new every night and playing shows with your best friends to a crowd of kids that know every word to every song. But even an experience as magical as that can grow monotonous and repetitive over time without taking a break. And the Perfect Cast EP was the first hint that the constant touring and newfound stardom was wearing them thin. The lyrical content is darker, more self-aware than ever, and sees Bren opening up about their mental struggles. I remember around the time this EP was coming out, Bren had sold some type of item on a big cartel shop or something like that, and I was in this Facebook group that talked about pop punk and emo, and a bunch of people were saying they never received the stuff they ordered from Bren. Overall, people were more concerned than upset since it seemed so out of character for Bren to not deliver on something. It just felt off. Then, at the end of the year, this EP came out and revealed that Bren was struggling mentally, and it all started to become clear. And just months after they dropped the Perfect Cast EP, they released their Tripping in the Dark documentary, which showed up close and personal just how bad things had got for Bren. Like everyone else, it made me cry and feel a deep sorrow for Bren, but it also made me want to go back and really assess the lyrical content on the Perfect Cast. Since since it functions as a window to Bren's lyrics on Holy Ghost. This is the portion of the video where we're going to take a deeper look at the lyrics on all six tracks of this EP. We're not going to go through every word in line, we're just going to examine lines I find interesting or touch my soul in some type of way. The first track on this thing is called The Waterboy Returns, and it's interesting because the lyrics on this song were written by Bren and Cam from Sorority Noise. It's unclear who wrote which parts, but on the song page, Cam is credited with additional lyrics. The Waterboy Returns is by far the darkest song on the album. It deals with ideas of slipping into depression, abusing substances, and growing up. Hey you, that's no way out, you can't find help in a bottle or a cut. They'll choose the wrong way to remember you, they'll find the wrong words to say. When you're struggling with any mental illness, it's insanely easy to find a vice to numb your current pain. 
For some it's alcohol, for some it's drugs, gambling, anything to put your mind at ease for just a moment. Even though this is normal, it can really distort people's view of who you really are. Because when you're acting all drunk or geeked out, many people won't know you're just attempting to process your emotions, and who they remember you as will likely be different from your true character. But sometimes, even your true friends who claim to be there for you during times like this aren't. They're absent when you need them most, even though they claimed you could call them anytime and talk about what's going on. And that's what Bren is referring to in this line. It's fun to be all talk, but I won't be here forever. And then goes on to give a self-critique on their past lyrics. It shows a lot of growth and self-awareness, realizing you can sing about stuff other than girls. Hey man, what you up to now? That's so typical Bren, all you sing about is girls. Take a stand man, you can find a voice that's not haunted by old flings. On Holy Ghost, Bren follows through and has tracks that aren't about girls. At least some of them. We see more of this self-reflection, wishing to grow as a person type of lyrics from Bren. Acknowledging faults and making it clear they want to do better in the future. Track 2 is called Alpha Kappa, Fall of Troy, the movie, Part Do. This song actually came out the year before on a charity compilation, but they re-released and re-recorded it for this EP. This is actually Jake's only song on here, but he knocks it out of the park with the little time he has. As the EP was coming out, Stereo Gum did a write-up for it, and each member gave an explanation slash analysis of their own lyrics. And this is what Jake had to say about his song. It's easy to be dishonest with yourself. In fact, most of the time, it makes life a lot easier in the short term. Pretend you don't care or just don't feel. It's not until you meet someone you can be unabashedly honest with that you realize how half-assed your life has become. Be real with your friends. Be real with your partner. Be real with yourself. I still suck at this a lot, but I've been lucky enough to have some really great friends slash family who keep me in check and force me to pick up the phone. As much as you don't want to, keep picking up the phone. Most of Jake's lyrics are story driven, and this song is no different. It contains three verses which each tell a different part of his day. I love his words because they never explicitly tell you how to feel or exactly what he's trying to convey, and his write-up on Stereo Gum is unique. Because other than that, I've never seen Jake be so in-depth and transparent about his lyrics. Here's the first verse. Downstairs, halfway dead, sucking down coffee from a black gold fountain. Is your home where you lay your head, or where your fake swordfish is mounted? Eyes cross, habitually, I will leave the room prematurely. With a tiny little pile of dark roast grounds where I once stood, just enough there to keep me safe. When they were recording this song for the charity compilation, they actually had an in-studio video where Jake talks even more about this song. I'll let you check that out really quick. It'll probably be about a 45 second clip. There was a long period while we were on tour where I really couldn't write anything because um, my mind was just kind of going a million miles an hour all the time. And then uh, we got home and I still couldn't write anything because um, I got really busy. And then I actually went back to visit my parents for like a week and that was nice, um, but I didn't really do that much. But I finally had enough of nothing going on that I could just like focus my thoughts and like a bunch of stuff that had been going on just kind of like came out at one time. And I was like, oh snap, I feel a lot better now. Track 3 is called Infinity Exposed, and it's about Bren being stuck in a cycle after coming home from touring, staying up all night, sleeping all day, and never leaving home, and then afterwards going back out on tour, and then after tour's over, go back home, don't sleep, and don't leave, and push away all of those trying to help you in life. And the more time you spend doing nothing, the more content you become with it, and lose drive to do anything productive, especially if you're also mixing in substances. And that's what Bren is referring to on these lines. It's not fair, all is wrong, again, I'm not right, content with regret, and it's so late, and I'm so tired, again, yet wide awake, forget what you said. And then goes on to explain the strange feeling of going back out on tour after not leaving home for an extended time. This is all so surreal, what is this place? So many mirrored faces, but not a single name. And it's alright, I sing it every day, 1000 times, 1000 ways. 
I've always loved how modern baseball will reference their friends or even past songs like on the last line of this verse. Bren references a lyric from their song Find Great. It sounds like their way of conveying they're burnt out and don't connect with or believe the words they're saying. It's the shortest song on the album and the one I've had the most trouble getting into, but over time it's grown closer to my heart and I enjoy it more each time I listen to it. Track 4 is called The Thrash Particle, and it's by far the heaviest hitter on this EP. It's the song everyone talks about, and the song everyone admits they've cried to. As time passes, I start to believe this is the best song Mobo ever wrote, and if not their best, in their top 10 for sure. The lyrics are so over the top sad that it's ridiculous, but it's a type of sadness that's only present on this EP and their following album. So this song is about girls, or a girl, and in the past, Brent has written about girls, of course, but in their previous work, the sadness which accompanied their tracks was very much in your face and told you how it was. But on this song, Brent operates under the show Don't Tell Policy. Instead of saying something like, ah, oh, I'm really sad, this girl broke up with me, I'm gonna cry about it. Bren shows the small details and instances which occur around an event like this, and the thoughts which go through your head when processing a tough breakup. Here are the first few lines of the song. Didn't watch your ex's set, I just left and thought about you. Like when your teeth graze those lips, when you begin to smile. Later you took my hand, you led us to the doorway, but you let go of me once you saw your friends. Later on in the song, Bren goes on to say that, instead of watching their exes set, they wrote this song about them, which conveys how tore up Bren still is about the breakup. And the fact that something as small as seeing their ex's ex play a show could be so triggering cements feelings of longing and loneliness onto the walls of your brain. It's the type of track everyone can find their own meaning in. Because throughout life, you love people and you lose people. It sounds basic and obvious, but when actually confronting those ideas in your mind, they become bigger and scarier than you ever could have imagined. And the first thing you want to do is stop thinking about them. You were all I needed, said I loved you to your face, but you just laughed and walked away. Track 5 is called And Beyond. And this is what Bren had to say about it in an interview. My family moved around a lot when I was younger, commonly bouncing from place to place. It became easier to say goodbye to others and, in time, move on. Eventually, everyone says goodbye to someone they love, but we weren't ready to say goodbye to each other, no matter how right it seemed to give up. This song is the most sparse in terms of lyrical content, and I feel like it's the one song on this EP that's more so carried by the instrumentation and vocal delivery than what Bren is actually saying. Don't get me wrong, I still love the lyrics on this one, it's just that I find myself more excited to hear the beat and the way the words are delivered, as opposed to hanging on the edge of each word Bren is singing. Will you stay with me? Please don't walk away, can't wrap my head around this, I don't want to understand. You and I have come such a long way for us to start again. The final track of this EP is called Revenge of the Nameless Ranger, and this song feels like the perfect segue into Holy Ghost. Bren talks about life, how it's changing, and how things are just different now. In their Stereo Gum interview, Bren states, Every five years or so, my life would reboot. New friends, new environment, whatever it was, now that seems to be happening again, and for once it could be for the betterment of myself, but not without sacrifice. I'm just not the same, and I'm never gonna be again. Pissing contest in the parking lot, I wonder if I'll win. I'll just point in blame to the bottles under the third bench, it's not hard to hoax a smile in front of your friends. Bren goes on to wonder why things change, who changed who, and longs for life to go back to the way it was. Are you the one who changed me? Am I the one who changed you? You're just not the same as when we met. I don't know you anymore. Can you take me back to the time when your clothes took up my drawers? In my short time on this earth, I've observed that when change hurts, it's often positive and an opportunity to grow. For example, moving out of your parents' house can be tough, 
It's exciting, but nonetheless a change. And there will be times when you miss your parents and not having to pay for anything. But that change is necessary to become an adult and grow into the person you're supposed to be. This feels like the first song where Bren hints at wanting to be done with modern baseball. When I first heard it, that wasn't what I thought it was about. But with perfect hindsight and seeing their fast decline after Holy Ghost, I believe that more each time I listen to this song. It's almost hard to listen to at times because it feels like Bren is so conflicted and confused, but in the back of their mind knows what has to happen. It's a beautiful song on its own and does an outstanding job at closing out the EP. The way they repeat I'm just not the same at the end of the song almost leaves the audience on a cliffhanger, waiting to see what that really means for Bren. The instrumentation on the perfect cast is distinctly mobo and still feels true to their style. However, all of the ideas on this EP feel much more fleshed out and developed than anything on sports or you're gonna miss it all. This was also their first project in which each member wrote and recorded their own parts, but at the same time also wrote together as a unit, constantly bouncing ideas off each other. For each song, it feels like they started out with a basic concept or idea, then kept refining and tweaking it until they got something interesting and new. I believe this is why everything on here feels so much more fresh and dynamic compared to anything else they've done. They also said they had a lot more time to work on it and didn't feel pressure to get another album out as soon as possible. A standout track for me which shows their progression as a band would be track 5, and beyond. The way it starts out reminds me of a rap song. The beat hits, Bren hops on, kinda messes up, laughs, then hops on again. And the way it starts out slow and builds up to the final outro is crushing and beautiful. The beat and riff on Alpha Kappa is hectic, punchy, and driving, which perfectly complements Jake's anxiety-ridden lyrics about coffee and year and a half long days. I feel the same way about The Waterboy Returns. It starts off with just strumming and singing, then explodes into an energetic punk track as Bren discusses slipping into depression. And for me, that's how depression has always been. It starts off slow, then gets more intense as time goes on. And this track flawlessly captures that feeling with not only words, but instruments too. This is their first piece of work in which all of the instruments match and complement the sentiments being expressed throughout the tracks. It's the one release in their catalog which becomes more perfect to me over time. Another lingering question I see surrounding this EP pertains to the artwork. What is it? What does it mean? Who drew it? And thankfully, I was able to find some info on that for you mates. So basically, Mobo had the idea to use an album cover for this EP, to keep with their tradition of using photos for album covers. They started going through photos their friend Jessica Flynn had taken of them while on tour. Quick side note, Jessica Flynn is an amazing photographer and played an integral role in helping Mobo become the band they were. And she's also the person Jake ended up marrying. So they started going through Jess's photos until they landed on a few they liked. After selecting the photos, they decided they wanted to switch it up a bit. Still use a photo for the album cover, but a drawn representation of it as opposed to just using the photo itself. So Mobo and all of their friends, except for Holt, participated in drawing potential album covers. However, it was their friend Bo who ended up having their drawing used for the cover. They said they liked his renditions best because it reminded them of when the photos were taken, but were also his own unique take on the pictures, which added a fresh new perspective to those memories. They ended up using two more of Bo's drawings for the two singles that came out, The Nameless Ranger and The Thrash Particle. This one is of Brennan Holtz, and this one is of Jake and Ian, when Ian was in his hospital gown wearing phase. When looking back at modern baseball, like anyone else, I can't help but wonder, what if? What if they wouldn't have broken up? What if they would have gone on to become one of the biggest rock bands ever? But that's something we'll never know, and with a case as sad as modern baseball, I believe it's important to focus on the things we do know, in order to grieve them properly. We know they made outstanding music, we know they had a great time while doing it, and they left us with something we can treasure 
for the rest of our lives, and it's up to us to keep their spirit alive and make sure their story is never forgotten. I will always be sad about modern baseball breaking up, don't get me wrong. However, I'd be much more sad if they were still together and weren't enjoying what they were doing. I just want them to be happy, and I'll be forever grateful for the music they've gifted us. Long live modern baseball. Thank you for watching.